Hey, everybody. Thank you all so much for uh, allowing me to preach this morning. I feel at home. Uh, so, yes, we are from Fort Worth this morning, but I grew up in Laurel, Mississippi. Okay, so, out, which, you know, uh, you know, telling people you're from Mississippi can be risky. In Alabama, you don't judge us as much. Okay, so, uh, my parents uh, are, I'm a third generation church planter. My dad uh, and my parents were missionaries in El Salvador in Central America for a long time, but my dad grew up in Mobile, Alabama, Satsuma High School. And so, Alabama, roots all in the Kendricks. And then I grew up, like I said, in Laurel, Mississippi, where my granddad planted my home church, Salem Heights Baptist Church. And I definitely want, I wanted to mention that because my granddad first heard of Jesus from Gideon's. I know you guys have a lot of Gideons in here. Thank you so much. We're going to look at today how to be, that, that the early church was devoted to the word. That's the story of the Gideons International. My granddad in Mize, Mississippi, had never heard the name Jesus except used as a cuss word. He'd never heard of Jesus, never, never knew the story that Jesus died for his sins. And then as a little fifth grade boy, growing up as an orphan in, in Mize, Mississippi, two Gideons came into his classroom and gave him a Bible, shared the gospel. He, tells, he told the story, he passed away a few years ago, but he told the story over and over again, how he slept with that Bible every night how he treasured it, and he went on to, like I said, plant my home church. At his funeral a few years ago, my dad said, if you were called to preach under Reverend DJ's ministry, would you stand up? And it felt like the whole room stood up. Over 100 men this morning are preaching the gospel across the world from my granddad's ministry, and does that happen without the Gideons? I don't think so. So thank you, Gideons, in the room. I appreciate you more than you know, okay? So Acts chapter 2, before I get there, I want to spend a bulk of our time today talking about Peyton Hill. That's, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, that's the last thing he wants, but just let me, uh, you know, say a little bit of what he said. We love Peyton and Jordan Lee so much, our best friends. Uh, he's the friend that the scriptures talk about that sticks closer than a brother. So I love your pastor so much. Acts chapter 2, before I get there, I want to thank you, First Baptist Prattville, for planting a church in Fort Worth, Texas. He mentioned that y'all support us faithfully. You know, uh, you gave us our very first funds. We started our bank account with funds that you sent. And so your fingerprints are all over Redemption City Church. I encourage you to keep praying for us, keep thinking about us as we, you know, continue to reach new people. So uh, 100% of the people who are part of our church were previously unchurched, dechurched, or are new to uh, the area in Fort Worth. Like Peyton mentioned, uh, Fort Worth is the second fastest growing city in the country. And so just so we, me and my wife live in a new neighborhood. Our neighbors are from Ohio, Washington State, New Jersey, California. Lord knows all of them are lost. Okay, they all need Jesus. Okay. And so... That's who God is moving the nations and the coast to Fort Worth, Texas. And he's given us, so from 2015 to 2040, Fort Worth will double in population. So it's amazing what God is doing. And a lot of times people say DFW, Metroflex. We don't say that in Fort Worth. We don't want anything to do with that city to our east. We call, it the, we call Dallas the D word in Fort Worth. Okay, so Fort Worth is its own thing. Fort Worth is now the 12th largest city in the country, little old Fort Worth. Okay, it's bigger than Boston and, and uh, all these, you know, Denver, all these huge cities. God is bringing us the nation. So please pray for us. Please keep sending the awesome teams that y'all send. You're a blessing more than you know. I mentioned that the majority of people, almost all the people that are part of our church were previously unchurched or dechurched. So really what's happening in America right now spiritually, I think, really has to do with that word de-churched, okay? So that's who we're really striving to go after in Fort Worth. So de church means maybe they went to church as a child but haven't been to church in more than 10 years or that they go to church one time or less now. They're de-churched, okay? And so a couple of stories, Colton and Sarah Adams in our church two years ago, uh, right when we were getting started. They're going for a walk together. They're dating, thinking about, you know, getting married, starting a family, and they're, they're de church. They went to church as, on Easter as kids kind of thing, but don't go to church anymore as adults. And so they're going for a, long, a walk along the Trinity River, and they're kind of talking. They go, you know, we're about to start a family. Maybe we should think about going to church or something. And right then, somebody from our team handed them a free bottle of water and invited them to church. And they're like, Okay, so fast forward two years, they're now married, they're, they started a home group in their home that just multiplies, so they're making disciples who make disciples who are making disciples. And so many stories like that I could tell over and over. Chris Harrison in our church, 19-year-old young man, 
lost as they come. I handed him an invitation. He was a barista at Starbucks. I, I invited him to church twice. The second time, he found my email, and, and we started having coffee. That was one year ago uh, or so now. I bapt he got saved. I baptized him. He just baptized his best friend. He just started going to school because he wants to plant a church one day, you know. And so, uh, we have Redemption City just, we're about to plant our third church, which is your granddaughter churches. So now you have granddaughter churches all over that are being planted. And so I could go on and on. Uh, I've got to get to, I got to preach a little bit here in just a second, but I just can't tell you enough. When, whenever you give to First Baptist, you're giving through First Baptist and it goes to church plants and missionaries all over the world. And so just let me speak on all of our behalf. Thank you for being such a mission-minded, generous church. I love you. All right. Acts chapter 2. Let's get there. So I love the series that Pastor Peyton has been uh, going through. I've been listening along with so many across the country. And the, the Bible is so surprising, you know. And so uh, at the beginning of Acts 2, Acts 2, God sent his spirit in this really dramatic fashion. Look at verses 1 and 2 of Acts 2. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly you can feel it happening as the Bible describes. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And now the church is born, and they have the most awesome source of power in the universe, the Spirit of God. But the surprising part is they don't load up on chariots to go take over the world. Right? They don't, uh, you know, they don't harness this power to go rule the galaxy. Instead, look at verse 42. Instead... They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, verse 43. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all within the church as any had need. And day after day after day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day by day by day those who were being saved. The, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. When I was a kid, and maybe kids still do this, but, and, and it's always a little nerve-wracking whenever you're from Mississippi and you're like, remember when we were kids and we did this? Because a lot of times, if you're from Mississippi, they didn't do it like you did it. Okay, it's something, I, I have found that. But I think y'all did this. Remember when you were kids, you would say, here's the church, here's the steeple, open it up, and here's all the people. That is biblically inaccurate. Okay, your childhood was a lie. That's not how the church, that this isn't the church, okay? Like even Pastor Peyton said a minute ago, people are the church. That was, that's what we see all throughout Acts, all throughout the New Testament. And so after Peter's sermon uh, that culminated with repent and be baptized, Luke, the author of Acts, gives us this beautiful picture of the church, a people, a people of God and how they acted, what they were devoted to. In verse 42, we see they were devoted to four actions. Studying the Bible, fellowshipping with one another, sharing the table together, and being a people of prayer. And what was the result of their study, of their fellowship, of their prayer? Look at verse 43. It says, awe. By truly sharing their lives with each other and studying God's word and praying together, awe came upon every soul. I submit to you today that that's what you're after this morning and in your life, awe. Right, uh, That's because you were created to be part of something big. Everybody in the world is looking for what only the church can offer. Only being part of the people of God can offer, and that's awe, transcendence. Uh, we took our kids to Disney World a couple of years ago, and we watched this really awesome kind of light show one night, and it's amazing. And the narrator ended the show by coming over the loudspeaker and saying, you're the key to unlocking your own magic. And I thought, what a burden. <laughs> I don't think I have that unlocking my own magic. I don't think I have that in me. Uh, and all we hear in the world is express yourself. Realize the power within you. You be you. Follow your heart. Believe in yourself. But then Jesus comes and he says, actually, empty yourself and believe in me. Now, if you're here today and you're apart from Christ, if you want your shackles tightened, believe in yourself. But if you want to be set free, believe in Jesus. Have you ever wondered why at times life kind of seems to lack meaning or purpose, you know? 
Maybe you've even reached the summit of what you were really trying to get after only to realize that there are more summits ahead and you didn't realize lasting peace by finally getting there. Uh, The narrative of modernity that you can find yourself by looking within yourself, that assumes that there is a real you deep down that you have to find. And that's the the basic plot of every Disney movie, right? If, If you would just let it go and not hold back, anymore, I would finally find who I am, but you don't find life's meaning. You don't find yourself by looking at yourself. You find life's meaning by looking at God. You find life's meaning by lifting your eyes from your individualism and from yourself and being part of a church where you give yourself away. What if you're looking to the wrong thing is to fulfill you and bring you this sense of awe and transcendence? We simply weren't constructed to live for ourselves. We were placed on earth to be part of something bigger. You're after awe, and you won't find it with anything this world offers. Forbes Forbes magazine devoted its 75th anniversary issue. So if you're younger in the room, a magazine is like it was the Internet, but then we just printed it out, and we would flip through it. It was great. So Forbes magazine devoted its 75th anniversary issue to this topic. Why do we feel so bad when we have it so good? In an age of technological advancement, so many things are going well, we're more depressed than ever. One of my favorite basketball players, John Morant, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't. He, he's perennial all-star, millionaire, super famous, has everything he wants. He recently said, it seems I got everything I ever dreamed, but I can't find peace. Michael Jordan, I know you've heard of him the greatest of all time, and there is no debate, okay? He says, he recently said, how can I find peace away from the game of basketball? He's accomplished everything in in the conversation for not just the greatest basketball player of all time, but the greatest athlete of all time, and still he's like, there's got to be peace somewhere in this life. He hasn't accomplished it yet. Jesus says he is life. The culture, we are looking for life, for satisfaction in all these places. So where does real satisfaction, where does true life come from. I can tell you where it doesn't come. It doesn't come from being beautiful or handsome. I can tell you that from personal experience. Okay. (laughs) That was a big laugh. So uh, you see all these people spending all their time trying to create the perfect body or image. Did you know Americans spent some $15 billion on cosmetic surgery last year? Why? You know, trying to look like the models on Instagram because the newsflash, the models on Instagram don't look like the models on Instagram. It's called editing, okay? Uh, I saw a survey recently that said that 94% of women, 94% of women wish they were more beautiful. So my question is, all of a sudden, if they were, would they really be fulfilled? Would they really truly be satisfied? I don't think so. Having possessions we know, we've all learned doesn't give life. In an article in Time Magazine called The Real Truth About Money, they said that money actually, quote, triggers dissatisfaction, and as material expectations keep rising, more money may engender only more desires. The Bible told us that thousands of years ago in Proverbs 27, 20, the eyes of man are never satisfied. There's something missing. The world shouts, live for yourself, Do what makes you happy. Do whatever you want to do. Express yourself. But what we see over and over and over again is that that path leads to death and despair. But if you choose Jesus, you get life because he is life. And with his church, we can finally find that awe, that transcendence, that peace that we're all longing for. So let's look at the four actions this church was devoted to, were devoted to, and the four results. First, devoted to studying the Bible. You know, Christianity is a word-based religion. God reveals himself to us in a book with words. So when we gather here, when you gather here, you don't come to hear some stuff that somebody wrote down this week, right? We gather to learn the word, to be devoted to the word. Our hearts are not naturally godly. Naturally, so we, our sin makes us think wrongly. It distorts how we live. And one thing that I love about this church, you're Bible people. Through and through, you are Bible people, and we believe that this book is inerrant. Without any mixture of error, if you cut us at Redemption City or at First Baptist Prattville, we bleed the Bible, all right? And listen, you know, God is not ashamed of one sentence in this book. It's perfectly God's word. And I think it's noteworthy that when Luke tells us which activities the early church was devoted to, 
studying the words at the, at the top of the list. Just as the Spirit of God was sent in power, this church, these people, they didn't abandon God's Word because the Spirit was at work. And the Spirit was working because it, when you're walking in the fullness of the Spirit, you're drawn to the Bible. Sometimes we see other movements, charismatic movements, as they think they're experiencing the fullness of the Spirit, they're drawn away from the Bible. That's not what happened in the early church. As they were experiencing the fullness of the Spirit, they're drawn to the Bible. Secondly, devoted to selfless fellowship. Look at how crazy these people were in verses 44 and 45. And all who believe were together. They had all things in common, meaning it wasn't your bank account, my bank account, it's ours together. And They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as anybody had a need. Think about the links that we go to to protect our money, myself included. Complicated passwords that we forget and multiple security measures. We guard our money. But this church, these people were selling possessions to give to a brother or sister in their church in need. Again, not just selling the extra stuff they had. Okay, stuff like one church member, you know, his daughter's sick. And so a church member sells his bed so that his friend, his brother can take his daughter to the doctor. He's like, hey, I'll sleep on the floor. She's more important than anything that I could need or have. So that's so uh, earlier, a couple of months ago now, a few women in our church were uh, having breakfast together at Cracker Barrel. Okay, and so about 20 ladies and one young mom was just kind of telling about how hard it is to find childcare for her two little boys, her baby specifically. And she's a full, she works full time. And so she was just kind of talking about her life. It's hard, she goes, I found childcare Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I can't find any childcare facility around Fort Worth to keep my child on Tuesday. She's just kind of sharing a need. And, and, and then uh, uh, an older lady in our church goes, I'll do it. And the young mom was like, no, I wasn't trying to ask anybody. No, thank you. That's so kind. I'm going to keep looking. Pray that as I look that I'll be able to find somewhere to. And the older lady goes, I'll do it. Bring him to my house this Tuesday. And for months now, this older lady has been watching this. And, and it's this, the body is there for each other. They were there for each other. And in that scenario, the young mom is so blessed. She, she's so blessed that somebody who loves her and loves her child is being part of the solution. And the older lady in our church is having a ball. She's having a ball watching this little guy that's rambunctious and full of energy every Tuesday. She's got more energy after doing it because there's something about the church. When the church is working right, when the church is there for each other, there's something that's special about it, this selfless giving. 1 Peter 3 talks about how church members should have sympathy or compassion for each other. Compassion. And it's, you know, it's more than just kind of feeling sorry for somebody. The word is a lot more specific than that. It's that you feel their joy or their pain. If somebody in your Sunday school class shares a struggle, you don't, you know, I I don't just pat them on the head and go, oh, they're there. You feel their struggle with them. Tears well up in your eyes as they're crying. Or if somebody in your Sunday school class shares a great thing that's happened in their life, you're excited with them. You share in their joy with them. Uh, The root word for sympathy there in 1 Peter 3, 8 uh, in the original Greek is splagma, which is this really great Greek word. It's an onomatopoeia. You remember onomatopoeia from like fifth grade English? The word is what it sounds like, like splash, right? So splagma. Say it to your neighbor real quick. Okay, so or don't, that's fine. So the, the word splagma, so in my church they talk back a lot. I'm sorry, I won't put that on you. The word splagma means a, a deep feeling of pity that works up from within, right? And so it's a lot, you know, it's not that you just fake being nice like we do in Texas sometimes. Oh, bless your heart. Okay, that's not what it is. You really feel each other's pain in a church, each other's joy. So let your love be more than just surface level platitudes. Really share it. And bear it together. The church, when it's working right, gives freely, voluntarily, sacrificially, generously to help each other out. Think about, too, how did they know who needed what? You couldn't make an anonymous Facebook post about if you needed a couch. You couldn't, you know, so how did they know if somebody needed to spend, you know, needed a family to spend Christmas morning with? How did they know if somebody needed groceries or something for their home? Acts 2 doesn't make that part explicit of how they knew, but we can gather that those in need laid down their pride so that their church family could know, and then the church was quick to be part of the solution. I think, you know, uh, you know, uh, Oftentimes, we can, it can hurt just as much by actually sharing a need. So I just want to encourage you to lay down the, it may not even be pride, but lay it down and share your needs with your church. And I know this church, 
First Baptist is a family, and if you're in need with finances or emotionally or whatever your need is, this church stands ready to step toward that with you. Uh, Third, they were devoted to table fellowship. There's a lot of debate here, actually, on whether Luke is talking about the Lord's Supper or not. But either way, he's emphasizing how often they share the table together. There's just kind of something special about sharing a table as Christians, right? And so, Baptists, we do this well, okay? We we love doing this together. In our, we call our small groups city groups. Every week, we share a meal together. Every week, we share a meal, and then we'll study the Bible, and then we'll pray for each other. And there's just something special that happens as you regularly share the table together, uh, as I've mentioned a few times, a lot of people in our church are new Christians or unchurched. And so we, we've done a few potlucks, and they're always like, this is a great idea. How'd y'all think of this? We're like, this is actually a pretty old, pretty old deal. Now, a few people have done this before us. But there's something special about when, when Christians eat together. I preached through the Gospel of Luke last year, and one commentary said that in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is either coming from a meal, at a meal, or going, going to a meal all the time. There's just something about it. So here we see... A group of believers, Acts 2, 5 says, from every nation under heaven, diverse racially, diverse socioeconomic statuses. Some had PhDs, some didn't have their GED, and all united and getting a taste of heaven by the way they fellowshiped together. Uh, Fourth, they were devoted to prayer. They were a community of prayer. They didn't just go by gut feelings or intuition, but actively, actively submitting to the Lord's direction. Throughout the book of Acts, we see that they're a praying church. They practiced both free and formal times of prayer. They prayed together corporately. They prayed on their own and without ceasing. They prayed in the temple. They prayed in homes as they walked along the road, as they encountered sick people, before they preached sermons, before they heard sermons, while they were being persecuted. They prayed for each other they, before they ate food to give thanks as they thanked Jesus for forgiving their sins, as they praised God in song for daily needs. On and on I could go. You don't walk far in Acts without stumbling over these people praying, being devoted to prayer. Again, not just like, I'm really for prayer. They really lived it out. Everywhere they went, everything they did, prayer was a part of it. Now look at the four results of their actions. As a result, we've already mentioned it, but awe. Oh, came upon them. God was moving and it was awesome. We use that word too much. The nachos weren't awesome. You know, Auburn beating Mississippi State wasn't awesome. Just another thing. Okay. Um, but this is awesome what they're experiencing. It's, it's awesome what we can experience together when the church is working right. I'm sure that Pastor Peyton shared this story before, but C.S. Lewis has this story called Holiday at Sea, where these parents are going to take their little boy to see the sea, to see the ocean and the sand for the first time. It's awesome, right, the, the sea and the, the majesty of God's creation. And on the road, so up, up ahead is the sea, and so it's over the crest. So they can't quite see it yet as they walk along the road. So it's just over the hill. But as they walk along the road, their little boy jumps into a mud puddle. And he's playing around. He's jumping in and out, jumping in and out. And they're like, buddy, up along, up ahead, over the hill is a holiday at sea that you can't even imagine. But instead, he spends the whole day jumping in and out of the mud. And so often, that's us. So often, we miss God's lasting sense of awe in our lives because we're toiling about. Or as C.S. Lewis says in my favorite book, The Weight of Glory, we are far too easily pleased. As a result, secondly, generosity. We've already looked at their generosity pretty deeply today, but I want to make this plain. This is how we ought to live as Christians, you know. Have you ever thought about what exactly Satan offered Eve in the garden? You know, what the snake offered Eve was more. Genesis 3, 4, and 5, but the serpent said to Eve, you're not going to die. God knows that when you eat of it, of the fruit, your eyes will be open and you will, look, be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan wanted Eve to find herself. You know, he wanted her to get on that path of self-fulfillment where her life was about getting what she wanted. But when I opt for a me-centered more, I actually get much, much less. Satan's like a used car salesman. You know, you ever encounter one of these guys that they'll do anything to sell the car? Here's what they do. They embellish the positive and shrink the negative. This sweet ride right here turns the base up. This sound system is great. You're going to love it. And they don't mention that the engine doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> That's Satan. So are the lies of Satan. He embellishes the positive and shrinks the negative. He whispers to us that making life about what I want is best, about my will and, and whatever I want to do, that's the way forward. He leaves out that it's a bottomless pit of searching. Third, as a result, they had the gladness of hearts, it says in verse 46. So 
the result of this church being selfless, and it's antithetical to everything the world is going to teach you this week, okay? But by being selfless, they became glad. By giving away their stuff and by serving, pe- by serving the ch- people in their church before they served themselves, they had glad hearts. Um, and it's interesting that the result of this church living out Jesus' way was both reverent awe and glad hearts that sing out. That's interesting to me. That there are times to rejoice with gladness, as we did this morning, and sing at the top of your lungs and raise your hands. And there are times to be still before the Lord in silence and contemplation. And both are vibrant worship. Fourth and lastly, as a result, salvation is every day. This is not an isolated private club, all right? Uh, this is not a hermetically sealed community of holiness, okay? A vibrant church extends itself in two directions. Toward God and toward neighbor. A vibrant church is going two ways, toward God and toward neighbor. The city around them could not help but want in on the action. It was so good what God was doing. It's clear all throughout the scriptures and especially here that there's an important connection between how we treat each other and how many people will get saved as a part of our ministry. It's amazing. As we give ourselves away, we'll have all that we need. You know, planting a church is by far the most challenging thing that we've ever done. It's, it's a lot like building a boat while you're on the water, you know, trying to figure it out as you go. But I'm convinced that if we'll serve people, we're going to be okay. If we'll serve people in Fort Worth, if we'll serve each other as a church, then I think God's going to take care of us. You know, in, the, in John, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. And then he kneeled to wash the disciples' feet. It's the way of Jesus is to serve Others, I got, you know, there's so many things I want to tell you this morning. I don't, if you're ever a preacher and you get one shot at somebody, there's just so many. I want, to, I want to tell you all about every word in this whole thing, okay? But more than anything, uh, the, the lesson that we learn over and over and over, the, the main thing I'd love for you to hear this morning is Jesus loves you. Maybe you've heard that for a long time now, but he really does. No matter your past week, no matter what you did 10 years ago, he really loves you. And he loves you so much that he set up a church just for you. So that you could enjoy and find awe and transcendence and have glad hearts like we see this morning. You know, every night when I have three kids, like uh, Pastor Peyton mentioned, when I tuck them in, I tell them three things. I say, Dad loves you. I'm proud of you. And you're my girl. You're my boy. I love you. I'm proud of you. You're my boy. You're my girl. And so when my oldest was, I think she was four at the time. She was on a playground. And she was just minding her own business. My little sweet baby angel was just playing and not hurting anybody in the world. And this mean-spirited child sauntered up to my baby angel and out of nowhere said, stupid, you're stupid. And my daughter, without missing a beat, she said, I'm not stupid, I'm Taylor Grace. (laughs) How is she able to do that? How was she able to not receive what the hater said, to not receive the world's feedback into our life? Because every night she looks into her dad's eyes and I tell her who she is. And that's what we're doing here this morning, for God to remind you again that there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Um, My middle son, Cole, uh, a few months ago, at 3 a.m., so I'm dead asleep. At 3 a.m., he taps me on the shoulder, and I look at him, hey, hey buddy, what's going on? He goes, is now a bad time? (laughs) But I think your relationship with God and even the church can feel like that sometimes. God, is now a good time? I'll go clean up first. I'll go get right, and then I'll get back in Sunday school. Then I'll get right with you. Let me go. God, is now a good time? But listen, he knows your every thought. He knows the secrets of your heart. He knows your deepest desire, and he accepts you and loves you fully and unconditionally. I love you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for giving us each other. You're so good, you're so holy. And God, even now, as we gather together, remind us again of how deep and how much you love us. And God, then help us live in such a way that we can find this awe, that we then forward your love along to bless those in our church, to serve and to bless and to lay our lives down for our brothers and sisters in Christ, God. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the way they've blessed my family and my church. In Jesus' name, amen.